Hello Church, welcome to our service online. But before we start, we have some announcements to make. Right, Jay? That's right. Coming up April 2nd, it's a Friday, 7 p.m. Crossbridge will be meeting in Key Biscayne and all campuses are invited. So we are super excited to spend Good Friday together and we will have a time of worship, time of meditation and the sacrifice that Jesus did for you and for me when he died on the cross. Yes, and on Saturday, get excited. At Pinecrest Campus, we're gonna have a big event for every age. We're gonna have coloring eggs, games, for kids, adults alike. You're gonna love it and it's for free. So be there on Saturday, April 3rd, from three to five. But now let's get ready. Our minds, our hearts ready for the service.
So here it is, my alibi heart. I'm keeping nothing back from who you are. No hidden treasure veiled by key or lock. You're a lifetime worth of worship, and that's only just a start. Here it is, my every waking day The minutes, hours, the years of endless praise For you're worthy far beyond all I could say There's a lifetime worth of worship in the nuance of your name So let it Incense, my whole life, a fragrance, every ounce here broken. I feel, and every breath and all free, my heart cries, this long sing unto you, my worthy King of Kings. Yeah.
Church, I want to invite you into a time of giving. Oftentimes, as a pastor, people come to me and they say, Pastor, what is the measure that I should use to give? In other words, what's the percentage of what I earn that I ought to give? And the Bible talks about the 10%, which is the tithe, which is a good rule of measure when you give. But I think that the standard for the Christian is not the 10%, but it's Jesus. It's the cross. If we are disciples of Jesus, if we are followers of Jesus, if we have received so much from Jesus, our lives ought to reflect the life of Christ as well. And we ought to identify with Jesus, not just in how we treat others, but how we also handle our resources. In the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, John writes this, By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. Are you walking like Jesus when it comes to the resources that you have been entrusted with? Are you giving? And are you giving sacrificially? Because Jesus gave to us sacrificially. You know, Mother Teresa used to say this, that Christians, when they give, they they ought to give until it hurts a little bit. What are you depriving yourself of so that others may have their physical, spiritual, and emotional needs being met? If you feel called to give here today, not out of guilt, nor out of compulsion, but out of joy, you can do so by clicking on the giving link in our comment section. If you happen to be watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube Live, If you're watching from our website, you can click on the Give button. If you happen to have an Android phone or an Apple phone, you can download our Crossbridge app, and you can give via the app as well, or you can choose to mail a physical check to your campus. May God bless you 
And may he bless the stewardship of these resources that will be gathered today. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are grateful that your son did not spare anything for our salvation, that he gave that which was most precious to him, which was his life for our sakes. Father, may we identify with that as we also share of our resources today. Father, we are willing to lose so that others may win. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I recently heard a story of a man that was driving through a suburban neighborhood on a very cold night, and he happened to run over a seven-year-old boy. Instead of getting out of his car and caring for that boy's needs, he decided to stay in his car and take off. A few days later, obviously, he was caught, he was arrested, and then later he was condemned for the crime of murder and negligence. And an interviewer, therefore, asked him, said, what happened? Why didn't you stop? You know you could have saved that young boy's life had you got out of your car and called 911. Why did you stay in your car and keep going? He said, I think I know why. He said, when I was a boy, my dad used to have a very expensive watch, and he used to wrap that watch around a handkerchief, and he kept it on his top shelf. One day, I was playing in his room and I found the watch. I unwrapped that handkerchief and I let that watch drop and I cracked the watch's screen. I picked up the watch and I wrapped it back up in the handkerchief and I put it back where I found it. Several days later, my dad found the watch and obviously he was very upset and so he called all the children and he asked, who broke my watch? I stayed quiet and nothing happened to me. At that very moment, I learned that I could lie myself out of very difficult situations, and I kept doing that in life. He said to the interviewer, you see, I failed all these small tests in life, and when the big test finally came, I failed that one as well. Uh, Jesus knows that our lives will be filled with tests, both small tests and big tests, And the only way that we can come through these tests is if we learn not how to recite this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, but to pray the Lord's Prayer. Today we arrive at the place in the the Lord's Prayer where Jesus encourages us to pray to the Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Will you read with me the whole Lord's Prayer? It's found in Matthew 6. We're going to read verses 9 through 13. This is what the Word of God says. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, The word that appears here as temptation is a translation from the Greek word, Parasmus. The Greek word parasmus sometimes means tests, and sometimes it means a trap, like a hunter would set out in the wood to catch his prey. But nevertheless, the idea here is that tests reveal who we really are. Tests reveal 
that which is inside of us. It puts us in touch with reality. So you can come and say to me, hey, I am, I'm doing really well. I'm eating really healthy, but let's put you on the scale. <laughs> See, the scale is the test, and it will tell you whether you are eating really clean or whether you're cheating when you're eating, cheating on your diet. Uh, there is a, a passage in the Old Testament that I'm reminded of, and it comes out of the book of Jeremiah, where God speaks through Jeremiah to the people. In Jeremiah 12, 5, we read this. God says to them, if you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete then with horses? When we pray to God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are praying to God that, God, I know that tests will come in life. But when these tests come, may, nay, may I not fall into its trap. May I be delivered from these tests. By the way, how are you doing? Are you failing the small tests in life? Are you failing the big tests in life? How are you doing? So let's ask the question, what can we do to be delivered when the tests of life finally come our way so that we don't fall into its trap. Three things. Number one, we must expect them. Expect the tests. Expect that they will come. Number two, we must be able and willing to face the enemy, the real enemy that's out to destroy us. And lastly, we must know the weapon of our victory. So let's go to one. We must expect them. Don't be surprised when tests come your way. What I've learned and noticed is that 90% of the time, the reason why we are troubled when tests come is not because of the test itself. It's not because of the circumstance itself, but it's because we are surprised about the circumstance. So let's say you were to lend Monday to somebody, and you know, you were lending money to somebody that you trust that that person will pay you back, and then lo and behold, the person doesn't pay you back, and then you're asking yourself, oh my gosh, I had no idea that, that person would not pay me back. I never expected that from him or her. Let's say you invest in somebody, that you open yourself to somebody, you begin to trust that person, and then that person flat out betrays you. And now you find yourself saying and asking the question, how could he or she have done that to me? After all of the care, after all of the investment, after all of the vulnerability, why would he or she do that to me? I had no idea. I never saw that coming. Well, we all know that lending money and loving are both very risky things to do. C.S. Lewis even wrote about this. He says, to love is to be vulnerable. It's, it's to be willing to risk it all and to be disappointed as well in the context of of a relationship. Those things are, are very risky. So do not be surprised if someone were to disappoint you in the context of a relationship, or someone would owe you money, or uh, if you were diagnosed with a disease that you never hoped to be diagnosed with, or if something happened in your life that you never saw it coming. Don't be surprised. Expect it. But also, don't be naive. See, Christians refuse this idea that just because we are Christians, that we are immune to tests, that we are immune to pain. Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, was not immune to pain, and Jesus was not immune to tests either. How does Jesus' public ministry start when you read the Gospel of Mark? It starts with Jesus out in the desert being tempted by the devil. 
undergoing temptation, being tested. So if Jesus was tested, you should expect that tests will also come your way. All of the biblical characters had to go through major tests, and you should expect that as well. Because tests play a valuable role in our lives. See, tests keep us real. Tests keep us down to earth. Tests keep us honest about ourselves. Because like I said, tests reveal who we really are. The tests of life, they show what's really inside our hearts. So let me ask you a question. How are you doing with these tests? Are you growing or are you failing these tests? How are you handling when they come your way? Are you acting surprised? See, Christians, not only should they expect it, but they shouldn't be naive when they come, and they should use the opportunity for growth. How are you doing? I remember a story of a young woman a few years ago. You know, this woman was in a uh, very serious relationship, a dating relationship, and uh, the guy happened to break up with her. And I saw her at church one day, and I said, uh, wow, how are you doing? And she said, listen, if it were a year ago, I would be falling apart to pieces. But I no longer look at men as my source of happiness and hope. I have found that in Jesus. So it still hurts. It's still painful, but it's not like before. See, she learned how to overcome the small tests in life. So when the big tests came, she came through. So expect them. But secondly, learn how to face the enemy. Who's the real enemy here? Is pain the real enemy? Absolutely not. See, the word here in Greek is translated as evil, or sometimes it's translated as the evil one. But pain, pain is never the enemy in our lives. Evil is. I love how the message uh, translation translates uh, this verse, the last verse that we read. It, It translates it like this. Keep us safe, God, from ourselves and the devil. The real enemy is evil. Now, even though pain is not the enemy, pain can be a great opportunity for us to fall into the trap of evil. How so? When someone hurts you, when someone betrays you, let's use the two examples that we use in the first point. That pain can be an opportunity for you to seek revenge, to do something really bad. That pain can be an opportunity for you to gossip on people. You know, lately, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there's there's been a few politicians that um, have been caught in some sort of scandal. And the reason why public figures like that often fall into these traps is because they serve their communities, uh, they serve their countries, they serve their states, and they say to themselves, oh my gosh, I sacrifice so much for people. And then they get this sense of self-entitlement. They say, well, I deserve sex. I deserve drugs as a way to cope with the pain and the pressures of life. See, pain can be a great opportunity for evil. Pain is a great opportunity for the evil one as well to bring you down. In the Bible, there's the story of Job. Have you read the story of Job? The Bible says that Job was a righteous man and that the devil comes to God and says, the reason why Job loves and serves you is because 
you bless him. You give him all sorts of blessings. And so the devil asks for permission to touch in Job's, Job's life and Job's health. And he says, listen, once these things are removed from him, he will forsake you. And so Job gets sick. Job loses his loved ones. Job loses his possessions. And, and each time that Job is going through pain and suffering, the devil is presenting an opportunity for him to forsake his love for God. There's an opportunity at each of those instances in his life, and yet he doesn't. He remains faithful. I look at the story of Jesus and his temptation in the desert. In the desert, Jesus was hungry. The Bible says that Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil comes to him, you know, because hunger is painful. And he says, you see these stones. What would it look like if you turned them into bread and you fed yourself? And his hunger and his loneliness here is an opportunity for comfort, to break the purpose by which he had entered that period of time in the desert, to break the purpose of his mission. And Jesus responds to the devil with the word of God saying, man shall not live by bread alone, by, by, but also by the word of God, the word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's the literal translation. See, so many times in our lives, as we're going through painful moments, we have failed the tests. We had failed those tests. We have allowed ourselves to fall into its trap, and we end up being consumed with sin. We fall in, into the trap of the devil and the evil one in our lives. We have believed his lies, and we have become prey to his strategies. What is the devil's strategy in our lives? Two, to tempt and to accuse. See, when the devil is tempting us, he is saying to us, look, I know that there's pain in your life, and you deserve to take the pain away. And there's something very soothing here. There's a bed. There's a cup. There's a business transaction. Do it. You deserve it. Or else, he comes to us in the moment of pain, and he says to us, you deserve it. Oh, you deserve it. You're a bad person. That's why... God doesn't answer your prayers. That's why you are alone in life. That's why you're going through what you're going through right now is because of who you are. He condemns us and he accuses us. And we must learn how to face evil when it's presented to us through the tests of life. We must learn how to face the evil one when, it's present, when he comes to us in the midst of the tests of life. See, we should see this as an opportunity. When the test comes, you should see it always as an opportunity to make spiritual gains. You must learn how to win small battles if you're going to learn how to win the big battles in life. They're preparing you for the big ones. And so you don't give in to that which the devil comes to you with you don't listen to him when he says, oh, you deserve it because I understand what you're going through. And you don't listen to him when he says to you, you deserve this pain. You deserve this suffering. You deserve that which is happening to you. You learn how to resist him. In the book of James, verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, James says that we should resist the devil and he will flee from us. How are you doing? 
Are you believing his lies? Are you falling into his trap? How can we resist him? Well, that leads us to our last point. Know the weapon of your victory. Now, what do we need to resist the devil? This weapon that's hidden in this text, that's hidden in this prayer. Here's what you think you have in order to resist the devil. You think that you have the willpower to resist him. When tests are presented to you, and when he uses those tests as a form of attack to bring you down, you say, oh, I can overcome this test with willpower. Secular people believe that you can come through the test of life through willpower, and so do religious people. They believe that you can come through the test of life with willpower. In the secular books you read, you can do this. There's a, uh, there's a guy by the name of David Goggins. I don't know if you've seen his Instagram page, but he, he runs uh, you know, ultra marathons, and he has these motivational videos. He says, get out of your couch. You can do this. It's about your will power. Exercise willpower over your condition, right? See, the motivational books that are out there, the motivational speakers that are out there are always trying to get you to tap into your willpower in order to overcome circumstances. And so do the religious resources that are available to us as well. They say, well, Here's why you're failing the tests of life when they come your way. is because you don't pray enough. You don't read enough. It's, it's because you don't do enough. And here's what I believe, just to be honest. You can exercise a certain level of willpower, but it's never enough to overcome the flesh and the attacks of the evil one. They are no match for the flesh and the devil. No match. Willpower is no match. In fact, sometimes the devil wants you to believe that you can have willpower in order to overcome or to come through the tests of life. And that's why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, he writes, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. So I hate to break the news here today to you, that you are not strong enough. This weapon is not found within you. It's found outside of you. See, the reason, look, the reason why we fail the tests of life when they come our way is not because we don't try hard enough. It's not because we're not strong enough. It's because we don't love God enough. See, if we loved God enough, we would be able to overcome the tests of life. How does a prayer start? See, everything here is connected. This prayer starts with our Father. Everything here in this prayer is couched by that understanding that God is our Father. And when you understand that God is your Father, you begin to tap into this weapon that if you take a hold of, you will be able to overcome the tests of life. Look, the reason why we don't love God enough is because we doubt His love for us. It's because we forget or we don't know how much we are loved by God. But let me tell you something. You are loved by God. And therefore, the love of God is the ultimate weapon that you can take a hold of in order to overcome the tests of life. And it's embedded in this prayer here, right? See, adoption, the theology of adoption which means that we are adoptive, adoptive, adoptive children of God. The doctrine of adoption is the key to your victory. Let me show you how. 
God has only one son, begotten son, that possesses the same essence and the same nature that he does, and that is Jesus. We are made in the image of God, but Jesus possesses the essence and the nature of God. And uh, Jesus takes on flesh, and he comes into the world, and he lives the life that we should all have lived, which is a life that has overcome every single test that has come his way. He is tempted in every way, we learn in the book of Hebrews, but he overcomes every temptation, and he sins not. And we all know that the reason why Jesus lives the life that we should all have lived is so that we would have and share in the life that he has with his Father, that we could also become family of God like he is, that we can participate in the life of God as he has part in that. He is one with the Father. The only reason why you and I can have any participation in the life of God, to have a relationship with God, is because Jesus makes his status available to us by exchanging our position with his position on the cross. On the cross, we that are sinners and enemies of God become children of God because Jesus on the cross becomes enemy in our place. And because Jesus becomes enemy in our place and he receives the penalty that we deserve, now we can receive the blessing that it's his, the beloved child of God. See, when Jesus is baptized, you remember when Jesus is baptized, the Spirit comes above him and a voice is heard from heaven, this is my beloved child. See, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, because of that exchange operation, I can be adopted into the family of God, and now when God looks at you and I, he looks at you and I through Jesus and that same love that he has for his only begotten son, he now has for you and I. It is because of that truth that the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.31 writes this, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is our Father, if God loves us, no one can stand in our way. See, God's love for you is your greatest weapon. And how many times have we forfeited the power that the love of God can bring into our lives in order to overcome the tests of life? Hold on to God's love. See, Luther held on to God's love every time he was tempted. Martin Luther at one point wrote this, so when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell, so what? But I know the one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and where he is, there I shall also be. Ah. <sighs> The love of God is the greatest weapon that is available to us so that we can come through the test of life. See, I like to say this. You know why I'm a Christian? I'm not a Christian because I'm strong, but I'm a Christian because I am weak, and therefore I need a strong Savior. And my God, in Jesus, do we have a great Savior. Yes, we do. So my prayer, my prayer for you today is that as the tests of life come your way, that you wouldn't act surprised because you've been expecting it, that you would understand that the true enemy is not pain but the evil that comes your way and the evil one, but then ultimately that you would know the weapon of your victory, the love of God in Jesus on your behalf. So will you take a hold of that today? 
Maybe you're listening to this message today and you are already a believer. You understand what Jesus has done for you and because of that you have been adopted into the family of God. But today you are living as an orphan. You are forgetting the fact that you have been loved by God in Jesus Christ. And it's because of that that right now you're failing every test that comes your way. Today I want to pray for you. Pray that you would experience deliverance as you are being reminded today of God's love for you in Jesus Christ. And when temptation comes your way again, you will not fail, not because you are weak, but because you know how much you have been loved by God. And if you are listening to this sermon today and you've never opened yourself to that love in your life, but today you finally understood that because of Jesus, there's hope now for a close and intimate relationship with God as a child. I want to pray for you because I want you to receive that love in your life today as well. So will you pray with me? First, let's say you're in that first group. If you're a believer but you are forgetting God's love, will you pray with me this prayer? Pray like this. Father, I have forgotten how much I have been loved in Jesus. Thank you for reminding me today. Allow me to live in light of this love and experience victory and experience deliverance. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you are desiring to pray for the very first time to receive that love of God in your life, I want you to repeat now after me. Pray this prayer. God, today I want to call you Father. Today I understand what Jesus has done on my behalf And today, I no longer resist that love, but I give myself to that love. I trust you for my future, my eternal future, and for my present, that you will deliver me, not only from the greatest enemy, which is death, but deliver me from all the other tests that will come my way. From this day forward, I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed any of these two prayers today, I want to encourage you to let us know. You can uh, click on the link in the comment section. There will be a form there that you can fill out and let us know. We would love to come alongside and follow up with you and maybe show you the next steps of how to continue to grow in your faith or how to start your journey of faith in Jesus Christ. May you have a blessed Sunday in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.